Thank you. We have a number of disclosures. So this section was built upon 64 papers comprising around 25,000 patient episodes. Now we're bringing 10 statements to the room of which there'll be two revotes. Starting out, the non-operative management of complicated acute diverticulitis. At this stage, it's important to say that whilst we set out with our search terms um, to cover all potential complications, the literature just isn't there for anything other than abscess or perforation, which is what we'll focus on from this point forward. So first up, abscess management. A systematic review, 42 papers of 9,000 patients showed that antibiotic therapy alone is highly successful and clearly it depends on size. Uh, it approaches 100% for the smaller abscesses and tails off to around 81% for all comers, including the larger ones. So therefore, our group's recommendation is moderate, with, um, moderate evidence, strong recommendation to use antibiotics as first-line therapy in all abscess situations. And this was strongly supported by both memberships as it represents the majority of people's current practice. We would have liked to, but the literature doesn't allow us to give any more details regarding which antibiotics, duration, uh, route, and other factors. Whilst we say that they are first line in all complicated episodes, uh, we can't say much more than that. So therefore, um, our expert opinion is that you should fall back on your local institutional protocols and follow good stewardship principles in the age of antibiotic resistance to use the shortest effective course when needed. And we found that in the voting, this was near total agreement. So now talking about percutaneous drainage. In the literature, as you'd expect, this tended to be used for larger abscesses than ones uh, purely managed with antibiotics. And the total success rate for all comers was quoted as 81%. The complication rate is not zero. Fortunately, it's very low, and the literature quotes 2.5% for problems such as hemorrhage, fistulae, or small bowel injury. And the reintervention rate is around 15%, primarily for things like drains falling out or drains blocking. So therefore, we provide a weak recommendation on low-level evidence that percutaneous drainage be considered when antibiotics haven't been successful for larger absences or in the present survey unwell patients. And we found again in voting this was strongly supported by both memberships and it seemed to represent the majority of people's current practice. Now, moving on to perforated disease. I highlight here we're talking about stable patients and where CT scanning has detected uh, extraluminal air, the majority of patients still can be managed successfully without operative intervention. It's important to differentiate where that air is. Um, the literature and observational studies tells us it's as high as the mid-90% when the air uh, is found around the colon. But even when it's distant from the colon, around subdiaphragmatic sites even, it's still around two-thirds that successfully managed with antibiotics and without surgery. Um, clearly, where there are other features, abscess and other factors, the percentage is likely to drop away. So therefore, on the low-level evidence, we made a weak recommendation that initial management is non-operative in this setting. And once more, we found this was strongly supported by both societies and in keeping with the majority of the current practice. So our next question, laparoscopic lavage. This certainly generated a lot of debate within our group and we're very interested in um, the revote that will be coming with these statements. Now, our initial statements displayed there, we highlight that one year mortality is equal, but where lavage is used in successful stoma rate is lower, although we accept there's a higher short-term morbidity and reintervention rate. We have to acknowledge at this stage there's no consensus in the literature what comprises an effective lavage. So therefore, after much debate, we made a weak recommendation that lavage could be used purely for Hinchy 3 disease by surgeons who are trained and skilled to do that, and not just the procedure, very, very important that the aftercare and, and the ability to re-intervene where required is there. And of course, in this context, um, it's very, a very clear and careful patient discussion is needed if this is being contemplated. So when we put this out to vote, 78% uh, agreed with the statement, 
but perhaps um, unsurprisingly, we saw a near 50-50 split with people 50% doing this, and in those that don't, uh, the majority, as you can see there, seemed unhappy to do so. So we'll move into the evidence before revoting. Now, as many of you know, there were three completed European multicenter RCTs, which spawned very quickly five meta-analysis uh, primarily last year. They all looked at it with slightly different statistical tests and slightly different endpoints, but some of the highlights are displayed there. The headlines at one year, mortality and importantly, quality of life is no difference between lavage and uh, resectional operation, which we'll hear about from the following groups. But in the short term, we do see that where lavage is successful, and how you define that, um, the literature, of course, says no further treatment was needed for that patient. We see the benefits of minimal access surgery do apply in these groups. These patients go home sooner, and there's a huge difference in the stoma rate, as you'd expect, and there is not a higher readmission rate. But the big question regarding lavage is re-intervention and re-operation. Uh, not displayed there, but the literature quotes around a 20% reintervention rate, and that's combined percutaneous drainage and or reoperation of any kind. Now, that's higher than um, patients that go straight for a definitive operation, but of course, doing that in the emergency setting does come with its own risks, and a number of those patients go back to theatre for complications as well. But the literature and the meta analysis tells us that 10% higher reintervention rate for lavage compared to patients who have gone straight to a sectional operation. And exactly as you'd expect, where reoperation is needed following lavage, it's for abdominal infection. But importantly, the low stoma rate is a, a very clear message for our patients there. So now, as we move forward to revote, we're very interested in, in the room's thoughts. So similar to the, f to the first round of voting, and now we have a look, will this change people's practice? And once more, that's nearly identical to the first voting. Thank you. I'll hand on to Dan. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're going to cover two more questions. One is question 4.3, which will have three statements that we'll review, uh, but no voting items for, this, uh, for the following three statements. So what we then went to look at was whether, uh, when uh, surgical treatment is indicated in acute complicated diverticulitis, and particularly as it relates to initial non-operative management. <clears throat> a review of the literature found that the majority of Hinchy 1B and 2 abscesses, uh, including those with the presence of periclonic air, can successfully be managed non-operatively, that is either with antibiotics uh, or with percutaneous drainage. Therefore, our recommendation bar group with uh, a strong recommendation with a moderate level of evidence was against surgery for Hinchy 1B and 2 abscesses or for those patients with acute diverticulitis with the presence of periclonic air. Uh, furthermore, the experts suggested that uh, surgery should only be reserved for those patients who have exhausted non-operative uh, options uh, and have not had any improvement. And the survey suggested that uh, over 90% uh, of respondents agreed with this uh, recommendation. <coughs> 
and over 80% uh, felt that this was in keeping with their current practice. Uh, subsequently, uh, we looked at uh, higher levels of Hinchy classification. So for non-operative management of Hinchy 3 and Hinchy 4 disease, there is a very low success rate. The level of evidence is largely based off of observational series. Uh, therefore, the experts came together and made a strong recommendation that when there is either clinical or radiological suspicion of Hinchy 3 or 4 diverticulitis, that surgical intervention should be considered as opposed to a trial of non-operative management. The, uh, the respondents, uh, nearly unanimous, and over 95% agreed with this recommendation. Uh, and the majority of people, again, felt this was in keeping with their current practice. Now, uh, well, we did discuss that uh, the majority of patients with Hinchy 1B and 2 disease are uh, managed successfully and non-operatively uh, after a single episode. And actually, these patients are unlikely uh, to recur. In fact, over one series that looked at uh, over 1,000 patients with an average of four-year follow-up, uh, fewer than 11% of those patients had a recurrence in that time frame. And those that do recur tend to recur in the first year. Uh, therefore, based on uh, similar data, uh, experts made a weak recommendation against offering routine surgery following a single episode of Hinchy 1B or 2 diverticulitis. And that is with the intent to solely avoid uh, future episodes of diverticulitis. When surveyed, again, the majority of respondents uh, agreed with this recommendation. Uh, and about 75% felt that this was in keeping with the current practice. Uh, the next question uh, has two statements, one of which will be a revoting item. Uh, and there's a question regarding how specific patient groups should be managed if they have complicated diverticulitis. Uh, the first group that we'll talk about are immunosuppressed patients, and this is a revoting item. Uh, so our initial statement was to state that immunosuppressed patients are indeed a high-risk group uh, for early, frequent, and severe relapses after having an episode of complicated acute diverticulitis if they're managed non-operatively. Now, most of the evidence is based off of observational studies or retrospective reviews. Uh, therefore, our experts uh, made a weak recommendation to consider early elective resectional surgery in immunocompromised patients who present with complicated diverticulitis. In terms of the recommendation, uh, there was near consensus with 85% of people uh, agreeing with the recommendation. When we look at impact to practice, however, 20% of respondents uh, said that the, the, this would not change their current practice. Uh, therefore, we wanted to review the literature. Now, again, as I mentioned, these are largely from observational or retrospective studies. Uh, now, to specifically define what we mean by immunosuppression, this means patients who are currently on steroids, who have been transplanted, have metastatic cancer, chronic renal failure, or on any other form of immunosuppressant medications. And what we find uh, when we look at these studies is that the uh, patients who are immunosuppressed uh, tend to have frequent early and complex relapses. In fact, half of patients who are managed non-operative tend to have a subsequent severe episode in the first six months. For those patients that had a trial of lavage, 67% of those patients failed lavage and uh, had to undergo uh, emergency surgery. For these patients that undergo emergency surgery after a trial of non-operative management, mortality is double that of immunocompetent patients. And so in one series of a few hundred patients, the mortality rate for immunosuppressed patients that had to undergo emergency surgery after initial non-operative management, mortality was 30% compared to a group of immunocompetent patients that where mortality was closer to 10 to 15%. So now we'll go to a vote. Uh, and again, first question is, do you agree with the, rec with the weak recommendation that early elective resectional surgery should be considered for immunosuppressed patients with complicated diverticulitis?
Great. And then the next statement to vote on would be whether or not this would change your practice. Okay, so 62% saying that this is current practice, uh, whereas 30% would vote to change practice based on this recommendation. Great, and the last statement uh, is concerning diabetic patients. So what we found in diabetic patients is that in a series of 1,000 patients, uh, of which about 164 of them were diabetic, uh, diabetic patients did have a slightly higher incidence of complicated diverticulitis, 12% to 9% for the non-diabetics. However, what was found was that non-operative management for the diabetic patients had similar outcomes. Uh, therefore, uh, our expert group uh, rated this uh, uh, with a low level of evidence, made a weak recommendation that clinicians consider that while diabetes is a risk factor for a complicated acute diverticulitis, non-operative management remains appropriate. And the survey found uh, that over 90% of respondents agreed with this recommendation and that uh, nearly 80% uh, this matched their current practice. Thank you very much.